What is that that seems to mold itself and shape itself in response to experience and is experience itself? What is that? Bliss, ecstasy, pleasure, sadness, grief, loss. They're all made of the same stuff. And it's in that that the freedom lies. As we loosen the interpretations, even the highest interpretation, that's when that true, whatever this is, nameless, vibrant, moving, creating, infinite potentiality starts to bubble. And then you can see everything that shows up in experience is this bubbling. All you can say is that it is what is. And apparently, clearly, it is everything. Which means it must be you. When you come full circle, you realize that there never was a separate self. There was literally never anything separating you and what is. Nothing had to die. Nothing had to be dissolved. It was a set of beliefs that the mind had. It's that full collapse. You null and void everything you've ever thought. You null and void everything you've ever heard on the path. And all that negation already takes place in what you are, as what you are. There's no awakening, there's nothing to awaken, there's, there's only this. Awakeness is fully awake to itself. It's constantly noticing itself and experiencing itself. That serves as the guiding light in changing experience. There's nothing you can do wrong, there's, there's no diving into and staying in awareness or being out of it, no matter what experience looks like, no matter what form it takes. You're listening to the Non-Duality Podcast. This is Nick Hyam from nisagayoga.com. And here with me is Colette Davy, whose Instagram handle is that beyond duality. When we start learning about non-duality and when we start searching or we start seeking, we are told about this awareness and it's taken as an activity. Be aware of your body, be aware of your thoughts, be aware of your surroundings. And that gets appropriated. It becomes a doing. It becomes something that needs to be accomplished. It's not a noticing that you are, by default, always aware. Yeah, we're commonly used to thinking about awareness or consciousness as a function of the body-mind. With that premise, upon hearing a teaching, we may try to use that awareness, like try to find it here and then use it. Awareness becomes reified. It gets turned into something or some function. The truth is the person appears within this nameless awareness as well as anything else that is here. It's not like I am a person aware of things. It's that I am awareness experiencing. I am the experiencing fact or this nameless immediacy of presence aware of this person and things. Yes. And that's exactly when the teaching falls back in on itself because you get to a point where you realize that any attempt to be aware in any way is actually taking a step further from yourself. And so you start to question the, le the legitimacy of the statement, I am aware. You start to think, is it really aware? Is that really the right word? This is not quite aware. There's something else here. It's hard to generalize the concept of awareness over the, this entire experience. It's almost as if one's like dulling it down. And that's something that you notice the more toward this awareness concept you go. The more you notice I'm already aware, the more you notice the default state prior to the trying to be aware, the more you notice that awareness is not the correct descriptor of this thing. Although it points us to the right thing, it's not it. Well, any 
description is not going to be it. It's going to be something that tries to symbolize it, points to it. Yes, exactly. And uh, you'll find that to be the case with every label. You, you think you've gotten the next one and it's right. Okay, now it's consciousness and you settle on it and then you realize it's not that either because you seem to be able to come in and out of these labels. You can come in and out of the concepts. You can feel, I've lost my awareness. I don't feel aware today. I don't feel like the awareness. And it doesn't matter what you feel. All of these human experiences, all of this apparently, I don't feel like the awareness. I don't feel aware. I don't feel omniscient. I don't feel omnipresent. All of these descriptors. But yet, you are it. It doesn't matter what you feel. It doesn't matter what I feel. If I'm sad, that means I'm sad, but I am this. Anything that can come and go, any experience, any label for what I am that comes and goes and that I can lose, I cannot be. Yeah. It's a sort of latching on or fixation on a certain experience. Ah, I've arrived. This feels good. This feels clear. This feels blissful it feels loving ah so it must be what they're talking about right you're simply talking about a certain flavor of this and the truth is this can be any flavor and there's no necessity for any flavor to stay around because it's not about that uh, it's not about one experience or a certain kind of experience it's about the experiencing fact that remains whether you know it or not and actually you can't not know it because you are that knowingness you are that experiencing whether you conceive it or not. Yeah, you go through all these experiences, all these emotional states. The person will go through so such a varied range of experiences, extreme grief, sadness, and ecstatic bliss. And when we hit that extreme sadness, the person who boxed itself in to some sort of label like I am loving peace or I am bliss is now confronted with the reality of the absence of that loving peace and the absence of that bliss. So it's about asking yourself, what is it that could make this and make that? What is it? What is the common factor? What is it that is taking the form of both of these, even though I'm blind to it now, seemingly? in this extreme negative negative state, it has to be it taking the form of this. So what is that? What is that that seems to mold itself and shape itself in response to experience and is experience itself? What is that? Not what is the emotion. Bliss, ecstasy, pleasure, sadness, grief, loss. They're all made of the same stuff. And it's in that that the freedom lies. Not in being a sort of victim to moods. It's tuning into that stuff that makes them both, makes it all. You can be blissful, you can be sad, because you know that you're that which makes up that bliss, which makes up the sadness. And it is in its own right, not bliss, not sad. Complete neutrality, complete vibrancy. If you take some time to inquire, you find that there is no holding on to any one concept, any one emotion anyway. There is no latching on. Even that is just a fleeting experience, really, in the grand scheme of this, in that seamless flow of whatever this is. Yeah, it's just coming full circle and watching everything collapse. This thing that you thought you had been taught is a contraction of infinite consciousness, this ego, this finite mind, this filter. We're taught that it's a limitation on consciousness, a limitation on what we are. But when you come full circle, you realize that there never was even that limitation. There never was a separate self. 
there still isn't a separate self because there never was. There was literally never anything separating you and what is. Nothing had to die. Nothing had to be dissolved. It was a set of beliefs that the mind had. One can't even explain it better than that about some things being wrong and some things being right and some things being pleasurable and other things not being pleasurable. And the false belief that you're located in the body and you are this body and you are limited by that. But even that in the grand scheme of things is observed and perfect and unfolding the entire time. So it's not even to, it's not even right to say that needed to fall away. Because e even post-awakening, these dynamics can take place. The person can rise up again and have those beliefs. It can appear as if awakening has shut off or you've lost your enlightenment. But that is taking place in what you are. So, yeah, it's that full collapse. You null and void everything you've ever thought. You null and void everything you've ever heard on the path. And all that negation already takes place in what you are, as what you are. So it's not even, it's not even a matter of identifying or not identifying with something. The person can be identified with whatever it likes as what it is. That's why there's no longer a problem whether someone wakes up or not. Because you see, that is what is. That's what ising. It's thising. And that, it's no more complicated than that. But we seem to want to complicate it. And I, to a degree, it's necessary. But this play of identification, even the play of identifying with God consciousness takes place in this. So all the identifications take place. And it's not even enough to say that when you're awakened, the person stops identifying because the person was only identification. There is no person and that play will continue. What can the character really do? What can the person really do? What agency does it have? What is the breadth of its awareness? Does it have awareness? No. The person, the character does not have its own share of awareness. In a way, that's part of the fantasy. It seems like the person is a composite of different things, including beliefs or ideas. But we can even go into those and we don't find ideas <laughs> or concepts, really. We just find this, the same stuff, the same isness. In reality, the, the body is, in a way, dead, so to speak. It's completely neutral. It's just a function of nature. So it doesn't realize anything. The separate self can't be aware. So what is aware even through the activities of the so-called separate self is not the separate self, it's awareness, which means that awareness is present even in what we call the separate self. Yeah dive into what you take yourself to be when you believe you are a separate self with agency and its own share of awareness would well, delve into that when you know that thing what is it like is it a somatic experience is it a certain energy is it a, just a sense is it a thought is it an image is it does it seem like it's a center like the solar plexus or something like that or is it somewhere in your big toe whatever it is if you take some time to explore what comprises this sense of self, what do you find but seeing, feeling, the sensing, the knowing modes of awareness? So you only find awareness, really. You don't find an actual entity, just as you don't find actual objects beyond the apparent body. You only find these sort of streams of of awareness, which are actually just one flow of life appearing apparently in different sorts of modalities. Seeing seems to be very different than feeling. Hearing seems different than smelling. But actually, if you really pay attention, it's just pure aliveness, pure knowingness, despite the temporary sort of configuration. Like it isn't just 
things floating in awareness all these things that are apparently floating in are that as well and we don't know what it is but we know it intimately it's funny if we call it awareness we struggle to find that awareness in certain experiences if we call it something it's like we are putting it in a box and then for some reason that box doesn't apply to all situations so this knowing this pure knowing it's the basically the largest umbrella term one can use to point to this thing but then people have questions about deep sleep and then they seriously are willing to dispute that because it does not feel like the waking state's pure awareness pure knowing and so that's another thing as long as you stick to something you're not going to be able to perceive that oneness because there are going to be experiences that seem to stick out where you can't find what you said you were and so if we when we dissolve the labels we're able to sort of perceive things different senses different smells different tastes visual perceptions then we can see it's all the same. But what's missing is the absence of that label. And then once you discard it, you're like, oh, okay, this is all the same thing. This is one. And as we loosen the interpretations, even the highest interpretation, we loosen awareness, we loosen pure knowing. That's when that true, whatever this is, nameless, vibrant, moving, creating infinite potentiality starts to bubble. And then you can see everything that shows up in experience is this bubbling. And it's all you. And it's not in a claimable way. It's not as if you can say, I am this. The I that would have said, I am this bubbling infinite stuff is not there. It's arising in that bubbling. So it's not claimable at all. All you can say is that it is what is. And apparently, clearly, it is everything. Which means it must be you. Yeah. And that discarding of labels of the subject, object, divide, happens effortlessly. Like, when you go about your day-to-day -day life, do you really think this is an object? When you're holding your phone, do you really think this is an object? This is an object. This is a separate object from, from me. Do you really sit there with that definite labeling? No. You don't even think about it in, in that sense. There's just this dynamic dance. Yeah. If we had to label everything that's going on in experience, you'd be exhausted. We actually don't. We seem to only label when it's sort of necessary. Yeah. And so this is never about some special platform or some special practice or some special status, but the normal, natural way of things. And waking up to that, it's not a character. It's not a separate entity who can wake up. It's knowing that wakefulness holds that character. And experiencing itself all the time and at the same time just a spontaneous happening one can't argue that anything is wrong on absolute level you cannot dispute anything that is happening ever mm. yeah there's the happening there's definitely the unfolding the flow of this there's definitely that you can't dispute that really you can throw out the, the systems, the beliefs, the philosophies. There's always this. There's always this wakefulness that you are. Yeah, and it's a dynamic acceptance. And it's an acceptance where you fully immerse yourself in the role of whatever. Yeah. It is that, as you said, that common factor, that dynamic context. Totally dependable, totally stable. It's not like... You have to depend on it and, and use it or cultivate it. It just is, and it's what you are. Yeah, that serves as the guiding light in changing experience. There's nothing you can do wrong. There's, there's no 
diving into and staying in awareness or being out of it, no matter what experience looks like, no matter what form it takes, from the most spiritual activity to the least spiritual, quote-unquote, spiritual activity, all of it is this. Yeah. There's so much relief in that experientially. Oh, I don't have to work at this. It's here. And if anything, can I relax into it? Can that sense of me relax into it? Yeah. Yeah, it can. Because it does. It always comes to rest. It isn't always perpetually active. That sense arises and falls like any other sense. It's only a sense, and it has a certain patterning, but it's only like the patterning of a tree. The patternings of the sense of self are equal to the patternings of that tree. Yeah, the what we once called the separate self or the ego or the personality was just features. It's just features of, neutral features of a person or of what appears to be a person. It's only in belief that certain features are wanted and certain features are not. Some are ugly and some are beautiful. It's only that makes it appear as if any feature needs to change. It's complete neutrality. They just exist. They're just here. Somehow we get the idea that the person with its features is going to change. It's going to become this super, like, enlightened, beaming with light aura, so clear, empty. But those are the characteristics of awareness. And those things, those aspects were there even with the features of the person. The features of the person have no impact whatsoever on true nature. The ugly bits, the pretty bits, the explosive, the calming, the disordered. There's a relative truth in managing those features, but absolutely not absolutely. They are beaming with neutrality. Yeah, and made of nothing but that light, nothing but aliveness, nothing but energetic beingness. You can feel into any state. If you really heed what is there, you only find aliveness. Yeah, in a way, when we look in the darkest states, sometimes we find it more clear than ever because it's in such a contrast to the emotional state of the human. So in this dread, in this feeling like death, no energy, this darkness, because the light, energetic, vibrant quality of true nature stands in such contrast to the emotional state, we see it more clearly. In a way, it's an incentive to look when you're in those states look because when you find it it's it there's something shining something very much not depressed and that can sort of be in a way clouded what is despite my lack of energy energized despite this darkness light and so then even depression is no longer inherently dark and it's not to say that it'll be transformed. It doesn't mean that it's going to transform immediately on the level of the human. You, in looking for the transformation of depression, you're simply looking for a shift into a more blissful state. But in, in accepting the state, the darkest, and looking, just noticing rather, noticing that which is not depressed, that's where the freedom is, not in the dissolving of the depression. We say the depression dissolves because in a way it does because it's no longer depression. You see what's underneath even the darkest of states. Yeah, exactly. You know of the state that you call depression. You know of it. It's that knowing of it. 
that is the same knowing as when there was bliss, when there was freedom, when there was whatever, come to the feeling, that which is aware, that which holds, that which meets that state. Yeah, the experiencer of experience, the sole experiencer of any and every experience ever. We're implying a subtle duality, but in those states, looking for that, even though it's a slight separation, it holds freedom, that neutral experiencer. And we somehow, we just go through our whole lives as this experiencer, but because of the changeful, because of the things that are coming and going, it's like our attention goes to them. Attention just moves to the more dynamic play. So the, the emotions up and down and the events. And we don't look at what is looking and the neutrality of that thing. The same looker, the same looker since we were small, the same experiencer. And it's uh, again, it ties to that same thing, the, the one constant element. It's much harder to find the one constant element in changing experience if you're looking outward. But if you turn it around and you look at what's not changing, it's this thing, this thing that never ages, never holds any opinions, gives itself fully to every experience, never holds anything back. It's that still point that doesn't have the ability to be happy or sad about something. It can't react in any human way to these things. It's foreign to it in a way. If we wanna if we wanted to talk about it as like an agency, emotions and reactions and emotional states are foreign to it. It it knows nothing of those things. It knows nothing of acceptance or rejection we call it acceptance because that's our interpretation of it but at the same time it's neither no exactly it's just an attempt to try to describe the experiential quality of that so we kind of say it's open it's spacious it's receptive it's loving that's all just provisional yeah instead of looking for the thing that fits a description notice something that's here that's out of the ordinary but yet at the same time very familiar and intimate but something that's not participating in the turbulence or something that's not participating in this event that you're so worked up about and that's where this concept of the neutral witness came in because this thing is so impartial that we sort of interpret it okay, it must be a witness, because only a witness to stuff, to us, only a witness can be impartial. Like if we're watching a movie, a lot of the time, that's not us, It's we know it's a movie, and so we get to fully enjoy whatever the movie shows, but this thing is not a submissive witness, but it's fully in the play, yet not involved. And at the same time, the ultimate doer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, there's only, there's only one experiencer, there's only one doer. So it's not like there are many doers all with their own share of doership <laughs> or many characters all with their own share of awareness. It's like there's one awareness and, there's, and that one awareness, just a temporary word, is also the one doer. It's one, one happening and for lack of a better way to explain it, by the will of itself, as if we were, as if it were playing almost, or as if it was simply just generating. You know, we, we suffer so much and in the play, in this dream, and then when you step out, even briefly, you seem to adopt the qualities of this this thing that's doing everything. And that's when you notice the, the playfulness and the neutrality and the doing this 
on such a massive scale just for the sake of it. You know, it's not human in the way that it wants to achieve something as a as a doer. And it's amazing because there can be this human idea of doing and this illusion of doing as separate things, but yet only this one thing that's breathing all this apparent doing just by itself, just just generating. Just So can you call it doing at that point? You can't really even call it doing. If it's all just this one doing, then there's no space to call it doing in a way. Yeah, it would be doing as opposed to what? You know, doing as opposed to... it. The idea of non-doing doesn't exist for it. If it's all there is, it, it can't do. But in a way, from the point of view of the person, it feels like you're just moving by the the will of this thing in a way and so then we like will say it's the only doer and i mean it's completely justified but yes on absolute level like everything else we just have to discard it because there's no word you can say a tree is growing but is the tree really doing that growing you know no it just seems like some kind of outpouring some kind of celebration of life some kind of ecstatic expression just flowing out it's like a volcano yes an overflowing of what is into this apparent experience it's a stream of creativity and it feels like the exercising of infinite potential just infinite creativity exercising itself it's not a a state that exists separate from the bliss and the sadness and washing dishes and sweeping the floor. It's it's not like one needs to stop all that stuff and disidentify from all of it in order to uh, examine consciousness. It's not a state. It transcends all states and all activities, all apparent doing. If you appear to be connecting with something it's simply a bleeding of this thing into the experience of the body mind but doesn't mean that you are any more any less it we crave the experience of infinity from the point of view of a separate body mind we we crave replacing the human experience with the experience of God or experience of consciousness, we we want to feel all of those qualities on a human level. And sometimes we do. Sometimes we do manage to embody these very absolute characteristics, but the fact that, that can disappear, the fact that people can have these massive kundalini experiences and then the next day they feel pretty normal again means that even that is not something that is it's not said shouldn't be set as a goal you're not trying to clear the person and replace it with this con mini consciousness or identification with god consciousness those are experiences just like anything else but we seem to hold them higher but even the most mundane human experiences can be if you investigate them can be amplified to such a degree you're just missing it because you're waiting for that experience of complete disidentification of complete oneness of complete ecstatic bliss kundalini third eye it has an inevitable settling you can't have a volcano blowing over forever it's the behavior of this thing to manifest as these transient experiences that seem so aligned with itself but yet are not it and then we mistake them for it and that's exactly why people think I've lost it I was so blissful I was so peaceful I felt so one with everything and now it's gone it's because it was the temporary eruption of that volcano and now it's settled 
doesn't change what you are, the volcano is still a volcano after it erupts. Right, and that's the way of life. Constant flow and shifting of itself, always transmutating into endless expressions. Not one form, not one state has to stay, has to be maintained. But there's always something that stays the same, that you don't have to cultivate, find, maintain. It's what you are. You are the constant same substratum in all experience. You are what makes everything. And it's not an identification. You're not identifying as a substratum. It's just a noticing. You were prior to the volcano during and after its eruption. And you were the contents of the experience, this unnameable, transparent stuff. It just takes which, whatever form. As long as you have any concept of what this is, it's not going to open itself up to you in all facets of experience. Because you're looking for something imposed on an experience which isn't actually there it's actually this unnameable invisible dynamic potential stuff so you can't pin it down it never becomes anything it's a becoming it's pure potentiality it's not the end product of that yes it's this this constant creating even if it takes the form of something apparently finite or something that appears to be this thing's end product. It's not. Depending on how absolute we go, everything that can be experienced has a start and an end. Even the universe supposedly has a start and an end. And that's, that's the oldest thing that we know of, right? So even that, even that does not have an, it's not an end point. This thing is constantly creating it's a constant bubbling popping it's creating every moment even the universe is not an end Mm. product so actually you are creating your experience the universe started when you brought that concept into this conversation and it ended when we shifted onto a different conversation because it's the universe is born through concepts just as like anything else There is no universe out there. There's universe in thought. There's universe as an experience. And as such, as such is transient. Yes, so even the oldest concept, even the oldest idea is, has no, it's not actually finite. It's not actually any ending point. It literally, like you said, that only had a reality while it was being conceived of. And even if we were to witness things that if we see an image of the cosmos or something, that is not anything until we give it a name. You are the creator. Something I'm thinking of can seem so real while I'm thinking of it, but and then I stop thinking about it, and until I think about it again, it's gone. Why? If it's so real... If this stressor in my life, for example, or this person who hurt me is so real, why do they disappear when I stop thinking about them? Even those things, even the things that seem so permanent, this is going to hurt me forever, this is going to affect me forever. They only have longevity in thought, and thought is not even one continuous thing, it doesn't even have a duration.